Ladies and gentlemen, kicking off the first stop on his world tour, our new president and prophet, Russell M. Nelson! You say you want some revelation, well here you go. It's gonna blow your freaking mind. Greetings, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the weekly Mormon News Roundup. I'm your humble host, D. Beza, which is talent on loan from Kolob. I'm bringing you this podcast with half the Kinder Hook plates tied behind my back, just to make it fair. My crew and I ruminate weekly on the great and spacious beehive. So thanks so much for joining us to discuss the latest current events in Mormondom. This is episode 84, and it's November 5th, 2023. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is facing yet another federal tithing misuse lawsuit. We're going to tell you about that. Tim Ballard documents another couple of lawsuits. There's some insane allegations that that we're going to bring to you. And the church's real estate arm has done something very unusual in Arizona. You're not going to want to miss a minute of this action-packed episode. If you want to get in touch with me, I'm at www.mormonnewsroundup.org, or you can send me an email to kolob at mormonnewsroundup.org. That's K-O-L-O-B at mormonnewsroundup.org. Let's see who we've got for a co-host this uh, this week. Rebecca, how you doing? Good morning. I'm doing great. How are you? Hey, I am doing much better than I deserve. It's great to have you on the program. Uh, now, we just had Halloween. What'd you do for Halloween there, Rebecca? Oh, let me think. Oh, I will tell you what I did. This is kind of interesting. They just opened or reopened a theater in my area that shows old movies, classic movies. So I went and saw Psycho on the big screen, which I haven't seen since, you know, I was a teenager. It was really interesting on the big well, screen. Well, I do hope you closed your eyes during the shower scene for modesty purposes. Yeah, you know, there was a little bit of this, but then no. <laughs> That's only fair. I can tell you that I did dress up uh, for Halloween, you know, and I found this costume from those spirit, uh, you know, those spirit outlets that where you get the costumes here. And this was a unique find, uh, especially since I live out here on the East Coast, John DeLynn. And this includes its uh, costume here. It includes a new set of standard works, the CES letter from Brody, the, uh, you know, the incorporation documents of the Open uh, Stories Foundation. And also uh, it also includes that you're supposed to redirect your tithing money to Mormon stories and devote your Sundays to purely worldly pursuits. But it didn't have everything I wanted in it, Rebecca, because not included at the bottom here is any meaning. And that's I, w- I would have paid yeah. extra for that, but it's just not included. <laughs> no, you have to make your own meaning. Everyone oh. knows that. Okay, I guess that's what I missed out about. It, it was definitely a hit. And, uh, you know, also, for, speaking of Halloween, you also I posted this as well here, the Halloween candy ruse. That's right. That's ah. right. Um, based on the, of course, couple's ruse. And part of that couple's ruse um, was if, if one of the um, women were forced to drink alcohol. They were supposed to take it, you know, transfer it to Tim and then he would spit it out. So I thought, well, the same thing can go for Halloween candy because we don't like all the kinds of candy that you might be forced to eat. So it says the Halloween candy ruse, if someone offers you Halloween candy, take it, then open mouth kiss me, and then I will spit it on the ground once you've transferred Uh it. (laughs) Um, You know, that that is a hot pick though, but uh, you know, that's not really my cup of tea. I can tell you that. I don't think so. You do have the Mormon joke of the week, though, right? I do have the Mormon joke of the week. Let me pull it up here on my phone. So many to choose from always. Uh, This is a favorite from Mark Twain. So um, a Mormon acquaintance once pushed Mark Twain into an argument on the issue of polygamy. After long and tedious exposition justifying the practice, the Mormon demanded that Twain cite any passage at all of scripture expressly forbidding polygamy. Nothing is easier, Twain replied. No man can serve two masters. <laughs> yeah, that's that seems pretty accurate for sure. I think so. Absolutely. Now, if you want to get in touch with the Mormon News Roundup, we're on Instagram. And uh, Rebecca, you're the host of the Good Book Club and also the Mormonish yeah. podcast. We'll include those links into uh, these show notes and you can get in touch with your humble host. That, uh, we're going to jump right into the news. We do have a huge week here. Federal lawsuit filed Tuesday alleges the church's investment arm of misusing hundreds of thousands of dollars donated by three men by investing the money instead of using it for charitable purposes as the claim was promised. So if you if you flush this out here, this is a, a, was a filed in Cheyenne, Wyoming there. And the legal action brings more scrutiny about how the Utah faith-based handles its vast financial holdings. The new lawsuit 
filed against the business and investment entities under the churches uh, under the church in the U.S. District Court in Salt Lake City, excuse me, in Salt Lake City, is similar to the one filed in federal court in California by James Huntsman. So, you know, we know that the church was fined recently five million dollars for using shell companies. And there's been a number of tithing lawsuits. But this is yet another list of uh, in a long line of church lawsuits. So what's your initial thoughts on this one, Rebecca? Yeah, my thought was, oh, here we go again. <laughs> but I think we were all expecting this. I mean, I personally have friends that are attorneys that are kind of working on their own, you know, different kind of suits. This, I think everybody, it's important to realize is a class action. Like this is something that eventually down the road, we all, anybody who's paid tithing before could jump in on. Do you think you will do that? Boy, that is uh, really hard to say. I, I really do not know what I'm going to do. But yeah, it has the full lawsuit here. It's just 38 pages long with the plaintiffs here. You can see, you can read through the entire thing here, which we don't have time to do. It's all been posted <laughs> online. You know, what? one of the issues that they took, uh, one of the, the 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 people who brought the lawsuit, they took issues with the fact that when it comes to making a gift to humanitarian aid, it says 100% of every dollar donated is used to help those in need without regard to race, religion, and ethnic origin. And they didn't say anything about how uh, it appears that a, a high... A, a lot of the money that you give to the church ends up going into an investment fund. So that's that's what they're Correct. taking specific issue with. Yeah, and I will say that um, RFM read this in entirety on a podcast. So if anybody wants to check that out, it was very informative to have him as an attorney go through it. So he just recently posted that. Yeah, and I think that the, the Nemo released a real quick clip uh, with regards to this, and I think the rubber hits the road here when it comes to some of the statements that church leaders have made with regards to tithing, and especially as we're going to see here from Bishop Budge, what he said specifically about the church's disclosures of what is happening when you do donate to the church. Let's play this, get your reaction. What L. Todd Budge said about Enzyme Peak's 2007 tax return, it wasn't an accurate answer. It wasn't meant to be an accurate answer. It was simply meant to communicate that we do not feel that we are obligated to fill in that box. Well, that moment of candid hubris is coming home to roost, as on the 31st of October 2023, a lawsuit filed against the church cites that incident as part of a, quote, effort to conceal the extent of its holdings from regulators and the public. The lawsuit goes on. COP and Enzyme have, in coordination, made additional misleading statements in sworn financial reports to the IRS. On Enzyme's 990 for 2007, its president signed under penalty of perjury that the book value of all assets at end of year was $1 million. The lawsuit goes on to allege that in actuality, the book value of Enzyme's assets at the time was approximately 38 billion, meaning the declaration made under penalty of perjury reported a figure that was 38,000 times too small. Oh. Yeah, so basically what Nemo is saying here is this lawsuit is referencing specific church leaders' uh, statements in public about what tithing was used for, and also federal disclosures about how much money the church had under management. It's not enough to just, you know, people will say, well, you give the money to the church and it's gone. There's nothing you can do about it. But the problem is, is that the 990 forms were uh, not just one time uh, misrepresented, but multiple times misrepresented. And this class action lawsuit takes issue with that and says you needed to be honest with how you are using your tithing. And you weren't in this case. Yeah, that's true. And, and not all of us are great at math, but I think most of us can do the math on that. <laughs> 38,000 times. And I think the church is used to operating with a sense of, you know, sort of anonymity, you know, very much behind the scenes. It, don't pay attention to what's going on with our finances. It's simply enough to give it to your bishop. And when I was young, I was told if your bishop took your tithing and then burnt it up in front of you, it doesn't matter because it's the Lord's money. I mean, that was how little we were supposed to pay attention or care about what happened to the money once you handed it off to the bishop. So those days are gone. Those days are gone with the internet, I think. Yeah, I mean, the church literally could burn up the tithing if mm -hmm. you gave it to them. If they made no, if they were honest about the 990 forms, about the 13F mm -hmm. forms, about what, where the source of the City Creek Mall, if they had been honest about all of those things and they had said, we are going to burn your tithing, there would be no issue. <laughs> the problem is, is that President Hinckley's statements and other statements around the time of the James Huntsman lawsuit have been adjudicated that a reasonable person could conclude that those statements were misleading. And we know Bishop Budge, you know, I don't like to use the word lie very often because lying, you really have to know someone's heart. You have to know whether they meant to do something wrong. Bishop Budge acknowledged that the church lied. It deliberately yeah. misrepresented in the 990 forms. This wasn't an accounting error. This wasn't some eggheaded accountant who didn't do it right. This wasn't a miscommunication with the SEC. It's a deliberate lie. So when you lie about assets under management, meaning... I'm paying my tithing. I think something is happening with them, but I've been lied to about what's going on. 
that's when fraud comes in. This isn't a lawsuit that's about the church's truth claims or about anything like that. This is about the truth. And um, any, any last thoughts on this one? Yeah, I was just going to echo what you said. Uh, previous lawsuits that we've seen have asked the judicial system to weigh in on whether the religious claims of the church are true. Um, I found out, you know, the book of Abraham is a fraud, therefore I want my money back. No court is going to do that. This avenue is corporate fraud. And there's a trail, there are statements, a court will weigh in on this. So I think there's a lot of positive hope. And, and I feel like we're going to see a lot more of these suits pop up. And I think we might see some positive outcomes. That I don't think anybody's going to be able to believe. Yeah, the circuit court with the James Huntsman lawsuit out in mm -hmm. California cracked open the ability to start having um, legitimate tithing concerns mm -hmm. when they said that a reasonable juror could conclude that the church's misstatements about the City Creek Mall in particular were problematic. And now there's other statements. James Huntsman didn't reference the Bishop Budge in his lawsuit, that statement. But there's a, a, been a number of statements that have been extremely troubling about what happens with tithing. So, you know, you can find the Mormon News Roundup on Instagram. Let us know your thoughts. Has the church been forthcoming about tithing? Is it no, nobody's business? Let us know your thoughts on Instagram. We'd be very grateful for that. And we've got a lot of big uh, articles that are happening in here in the news here. And uh, just a couple of days ago, Rebecca, teen allegedly taken by mom, uncle, as part of doomsday prophecy found at Canadian border. So on the left here, we have Spring Thibodeau left and also Brooke Hale uh, on the right they were arrested after allegedly taking spring thibodeau's juvenile son with them to the canadian border the family was believed to be leaving the u.s based on extreme religious views regarding doomsday prophecies so that's what i'm wondering here what does this have to do rebecca with the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints what doesn't it have to do with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? That's what I would ask. No, and, and you know, there's so many different events that are happening, and they're all so connected. And so many people have done really informative podcasts about that. I think John Dolan has podcasted like 20 hours straight, practically, on all the connections here. But but there is this sort of apocalyptic undercurrent um, fueled by near-death experiences, I believe. Our podcast, Mormonish Podcast, just did a whole um, episode on you know what near-death experiences really are because a lot of people that have them then sort of set themselves up as an authority, somebody who can contact the other side. You have people like this Doomsday family that follow people who have had these near-death experiences. And, and part of this baked in seems to be you know the end of the world is near. Um, these This family believed that their son was the Davidic servant servant, a very special person who's supposed to usher in the second coming, a pivotal person. So part of the reason they they took him is to protect him because he has such a pivotal role. So it's all baked into Mormonism. And there's a lot of scriptural uh, basis if you interpret it that way for all of this to be correct. So I think when all of us saw the doomsday family unfolding, we were like, okay, here we go again. And I believe it's only a question of, okay, when's it going to happen next? It's not going to stop. Yeah, so that's what I was wondering this week. I tried to do a little bit of research. Who is Spring Thibodeau? Uh, all about the Mormon mother arrested after taking teenage son, who's pictured here, to Alaska over a doomsday prophecy. So um, Spring Thibodeau and her brother, Brooke Hale, have been taken into custody for allegedly taking their son into Alaska for the second coming of Christ. They're doomsday believers. And when leaving their house, Spring asked her husband to file a fake missing persons report for the 16-year-old son, Blaze. And Spring is described as a woman who believed in Mormonism, she, along with her husband, would regularly go to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It has been reported that in 2015, Spring Thibodeau started showing interest in doomsday teachings, and she eventually involved, uh, which eventually involved the couple's daughter. So there's been a number of people who have done podcasts on this, including a uh, nuance, including Mormon mm -hmm. stories. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, people who have been following this very carefully. I wish we had more time in order to follow it ourselves, but we don't. Um, but, you know, I'm very troubled by the people who believe in these apocalyptic mindsets who put their lives at, at risk and, mm -hmm. you know, um, they put their children's lives at risk. We, we saw the same sort of stuff with uh, Chad Debo, Lori Vallow. We, we've mm -hmm. seen this time and time again. And usually what ends up happening with these doomsday preppers um, is that people end up getting hurt. People end up getting killed. They go missing. They're neglected. And it's an extremely harmful uh, mindset. A any last thoughts on this uh, Spring Thibodeau mess? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to dive into, but the connections are there. I would bring up Brian David Mitchell, who kidnapped Elizabeth Smart. Like you said, often the people that are hurt and abused or killed are children or vulnerable adults. So Brian David Mitchell believed that he was this Davidic servant, uh, the same belief that the Doomsday family had about their, their son. And that kind of fueled his uh, his 
doomsday um, views and eventually led to the kidnapping of Elizabeth Smart. And that, of course, uh, was Abraham Gileadi. That's who <laughs> Brian David Mitchell followed. So I know it's like a family tree. You just have to try to connect the dots to realize that there's this undercurrent. And it's not it's not a matter of if, it's when something else is going to rear its ugly head. So that's scary. Yeah, I thought we were going to wrap this up. I do have one more clip to play because it reminds me of Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell, because Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell, they were uh, Temple recommend holding members mm -hmm. of the Church of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. of Latter-day Saints. And so are the folks that are in here. In fact, um, presumed criminal doomsday mo Mormon mom, she was actually a temple worker, which, you know, mm -hmm. is kind of high up in the hierarchy. Let me play this clip here from um, where John was, uh, was speaking with the Hidden True Crime podcast about Miss Thibodeau. Shot you shared. Do you want to tell us what this is and why you thought it was interesting? Yeah, yeah. In all of these cases, including the Daybell case, those of us that are LDS, you know, we think, well, they they weren't going to church or they were maybe with a fundy, you know, a fundamentalist, or they, you know, were some breakoff group. Here is Spring Thibodeau in good standing. Uh, shows the ward she's in. Uh, she is a temple ordinance worker in Gilbert, Arizona. It's also very chilling because Lori Vallow Daybell was also in the temple almost every day. Her temple attendance was actually the subject at trial. So it's just interesting that here we have another Gilbert, Arizona, very close to where Lori was. It's the same town as Zulema and Melanie Gibb. What's in the water of Gilbert, Arizona? I know you have to ask that. You you do wonder what is going on in, in not just Rexburg, but in Gilbert, Arizona area uh, with some members. We're not. Yeah, I mean, I just I do wonder about this. You know, the church doesn't come out very strongly against these mm -mm. type of folks. I, nope. You know, they're quick to uh, release a statement about Tim Ballard, but yep. they're not quick to release statements about these folks and condemn them either before it happens or after. These folks always seem to be in great standing with the church right up until the moment when something absolutely insane happens. We can yep. never quite get ahead of these people. No one in their ward. We have a ministering program that people are being visited. They're going to church every single Sunday. And nobody picked up on the fact that these folks have incredibly dangerous and bizarre and uh, a, a criminal beliefs that are going to get yep. people harmed or hurt. And nobody ever seems to report anything around here. No, that's true. And in the Doomsday family's uh, case, the husband took the wife to the bishop, um, I think back in 2014-ish, and said she's gotten involved in this. You know, she's following, you know, these preppers and these Doomsday um, ideologies. And the bishop just said, well, stop that. You know, and then of course she didn't. Then she knew she kind of had to go more underground on it. And I think that's kind of the key. So, you know, John says what's in the water in Gilbert. I say what's in the water in Mormonism, honestly. Yeah, and this isn't the only article that we're going to cover here from Arizona as well. Just uh, right uh, actually down the street, I guess, from Gilbert, Arizona, there's the church is involved with a huge project here that we kind of have seen. It's been percolating. We've seen a lot of rumors about it um, all the way back up until last year. But the church um, is going to develop a build to rent project in Queen Creek. So they purchased the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is one of the largest landowners in Arizona and in the entire United States. They're, they're buying um, land near Pima and Meridian Roads to pave the way for development. So this is just basically mostly empty land from my understanding here. And they're going to build on 54 acres, 320 units. And, th and these acres were um, owned by the church. They were annexed in the town. The church, um, this is going to be an absolutely incredibly expensive project. And the rumors that I have about this project, I, you know, we don't have the exact figures on it, but the rumors are this is going to be a $600 $660 million project. This is going to be a massive investment in the church in Arizona. Yeah, I'm not surprised. And like you said, we have heard rumors, and this is kind of the MO to develop mostly around temples, like these huge housing developments with extremely high end houses that most of us can't afford to, to ever consider if we even wanted to live next to a temple. But yeah, it does seem to be the way it is. And also, this kind of alluded to me that it was more of a protected community, maybe a community with a certain look and feel. Did you get gated. that sense from the article? Yes. Yeah, I want to say gated, both yeah. physically and metaphorically. I think. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. You know, and Nemo tweeted this out as well. You know, I follow Nemo's channel pretty well. He says, well, wait a minute, the church, they're a tax exempt charity, right? So, so they're not meant to be a real estate empire, are they? 
And of course, it begs the question, yeah. you know, will these be tax exempt? You know, the church presumably pays taxes on its commercial real estate venture. So this is not going to be the church has a number of real estate arms within it and companies that are incorporated to do real estate. And they vary from country to country. But this will be done through the commercial commercial real estate arms. So these folks who are here and presumably the church itself is going to be paying property taxes mm -hmm. to help pay for the services in Gilbert, Arizona. But it does beg the question, you know, I thought this was supposed to be the church is supposed to be the kingdom of God on earth not uh, you know uh, investing in real estate like a tie becoming a real estate tycoon and a real estate juggernaut it it's not such a far stretch to see that you have to pay to get into the kingdom of God. I mean, we already do that, right? Or did that as Mormons. And if this is the kingdom of God on earth, we're paying to get in this too. Extremely high end housing development behind a gate. Yeah. In fact, I looked it up here. Um, I looked up on a uh, realtor.com, some of these, uh, some of this area. And I just want to show you the typical house. This would be like a build, uh, a, a, a build, uh, a custom built property in this area oh. here in Queen Creek. Wow. And these properties, this is just a regular 3000 square foot home, three bedroom, three and a half bathroom, uh, you know, build custom built in this area. And it's going for almost a million dollars. But Rebecca, this is this particular home here that we're looking at. This isn't behind a gated community. And it's not all that big of a project. You know, the homes that we're looking at here that are going to be in this project here are going to be a million dollars, a million and a half dollars, two million dollar buildings. So the you know? low end homes, those are the low end <laughs> homes. I get it. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So a, a million dollars in this area, that's a low, that's a typical low end home. So yeah. I mean, if you're building Starter home, <laughs> yeah. If you're building that many units, what did I say? Three hundred and was it uh -huh. two hundred, three hundred, uh, uh, three hundred units? Uh, the exact number here: three hundred and twenty units in between one and two million dollars. That tracks with not not to mention the fact that you have to own the land and everything else. Mm -hmm. That tracks with what we were thinking of six hundred and sixty million dollars. So, I mean, we covered. I had Patrick Mason on the broadcast last uh, mm -hmm. uh, last episode, and he talked about, hey, the church is doing great things in Florida by donating a million dollars. We need to look at the what is the church actually spending real dollars on. Right. We have a million in Florida, and at the same time, we have six hundred million dollars in Arizona. I mean, the priorities of the church. Um, are incredibly, you know, it, you follow the money. You know what I mean? Follow the money. Yep. That's it. You said it. It makes me think of, um, you know, how Mormonish podcast is kind of working with the Heber residents who are um, trying to get the temple that's being built. They're relocated to more appropriate place. And where they live, they live in a gated community um, overlooking where the temple site will be. There are several apostles that live there, a state president, I think a couple of general authorities and the church owns two lots in this gated community. But they told us that it was, it was sort of similar to this development. I mean, it wasn't um, from the church, but it was a developer that created it thinking that, you know, wealthy Mormons would want to retire there, would be able to buy all these homes. And they said that that didn't really work out. Um, they built it and the Mormons did not come. So then it was kind of more opened up to everybody. And so they have kind of a mix. But just because you build it doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to be able to afford it or going to be able to move in. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, when the church is donating a lot of big money, what do they donate it on? We had the Kent Washington uh, Amazon mm -hmm. warehouse that the church bought last year, which yep. was the largest deal on the West Coast. I want to say it was three hundred and fifty million dollars. They in England they bought Alder Castle, which is a huge a complex there in Wembley. Um, <laughs> they have projects like this. Um, so if, if you look in general conference, the church is announcing a billion dollars of new temples, uh, every single general conference, one billion dollars with the new temples. And on the other hand, we have in Florida, one million dollars for a food bank. So just the, yeah. the, the difference in what the church's priority here is very significant. And let me just say one other thing. We had Ryan Josiah on this program, um, who's one of my fa all time favorite episodes and one of the great TikTok channels out there. He has a great TikTok channel. He, he, he's got this. Uh, he's queuing this up that talks about what happens when mega churches become your landlord, because it's not. It's one thing to go to church on Sunday. It's another thing to pay tithing to the church. What happens and when the church is, becomes your landlord? And he's got this clip here. I want to uh, cue this up for you get your reaction. I mean, your new landlord, I told you that the governor of California signed a law allowing churches in California to build housing on their land. Apparently, this is an idea that's taking off across the country. In Arizona, a city called Queens Creek recently approved a zoning change for the Mormon Church. The Mormon Church is the fifth largest landowner in the entire country. In Queens Creek, they've taken 54 acres they've owned and plan to build a village. It'll be gated. It'll never be for sale. The Mormon Church will be the landlord. 
the city approved the change to high density building without a single comment from the local population. The Mormon church is tax exempt. Let's assume that all the rent paid on these homes will be tax exempt income. But will they pay property taxes? Probably. Technically, churches don't pay property taxes, but the property has to be a place of worship or parking for the worship or schools for the church. So housing creates a new conundrum. Additionally, there are federal housing laws where rentals cannot be accepted or denied based on the religion of the applicant. This is the beginning of major housing complexes built by churches. I can't find anywhere the stipulation on whether or not they will be paying proper taxes to support the local community. They'll be using the local sewer system, trash pickup, mm -hmm. utilities, the roads, and potentially the local schools. So it would make sense that they pay property taxes. But I, I assume that they will be paying property taxes on this, but um, what's it like having, you know, it's one thing, we both work for the church for a long time. It's one thing mm -hmm. to go to church, work for the church, pay your tithing to the church. All of a sudden, what happens when you live on the church, yeah. you know, and the church becomes your landlord? That's a new relationship. It is. And there's so much control. I don't think people have thought this through. This clip, which I hadn't seen before, actually makes me really happy because this is what it takes other people to wake up and go, wait a minute, what is happening here? How are they doing this? How are they manipulating the laws in the county and the city? Which again, on Mormonish podcast, working with the residents of Cody and Heber, we are seeing this in real time, you know, very close to what's going on. So I love that this woman is looking into this and sort of starting perhaps to raise an alarm about it. Um, it, it is. It's very interesting, I think. Yeah, we see the church pushing through all of its real estate mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, through either threats of lawsuits or, mm -hmm. as we saw in Cody, potential bribes to city employees. Yep. And um, in Heber, yeah. also the lawsuits are already rolling. The church is going to try to push these th these things through because they want to be able to generate the income that's going to be associated with these projects. And that does remind me, you know, uh, Rebecca, that we do have the Mormon News Roundup poll of the week here. And uh, <laughs> this is the um, this is a poll that goes along with this particular article. And, you know, Rebecca, don't take this poll too seriously. I'll just put it that way. But uh, can you read us the uh, poll of the week here? What is the poll? Yeah, let's go through it. Okay, it's the top 10 things that you didn't know about the LDS Church's $100 million plus build to rent community in Arizona. Yeah, a million dollars would be, yes, very interesting. This would be a minimum, minimum level would be a hundred million, probably more right. like five, six hundred million dollars. Oh, yeah. Now, we release all of our episodes live every Sunday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you come to YouTube at that time, you can take your the poll along with us and interact with your humble host and or host. So I want you to be <laughs> the first person to take our poll here, Rebecca. And uh, like I said, don't take this poll too seriously. <sighs> but uh, I, uh, here's your number one. All right, let's see. Um, number one is President Hinckley wants us to know that no tithing has been or will be used. Yeah, it, but a little caveat there, Rebecca, terms and conditions apply. Uh, I yes. didn't pay attention to that and I probably should have. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I think President Hinckley should have paid attention to it too now that I think about it. You know? I think everybody in church leadership wishes he would have paid attention to yeah, it at this sure. point. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Bishop Budge might have wanted to uh, pay, pay attention yeah. to that too. Yeah, but sure, I'm sure there's absolutely no tithing that's involved with this whatsoever, nope. nor there has been. No, I'm sure no, no, absolutely no, no, not. No, no, no. No, as President we can trust President Hinckley, or maybe not. Uh, how about number two? Uh, all right. President Ballard released a statement through a rogue church spokesperson that he has absolutely no financial interest in this community. Well, yet. That's a, if you read the fine print oh, again. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. The yeah. fine print. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's all about the fine print that I've noticed, you know? Or how about number three? Um, the HOA will strongly enforce the BYU honor code. <laughs> Hence, Rebecca, you need to be very careful who you hold Ooh. hands with in this community. Could get yeah. you in a lot of trouble. Yeah, even in the privacy of your own home. I think maybe that's the thing that people don't realize. I mean, here in Utah, we have self-policing by neighbors. You know, <laughs> That does happen, but this will be on an institutional scale, I think. Yeah, that's why I've got this meme here. I command you to make my facial hair and flowing mane violations of the BYU honor code. I wonder if you're <laughs> going to be able to wear sandals if you're in the pool in your backyard at this HOA, by the way. I wonder. I'm thinking no. Well, we don't want to send the wrong message, so I'm, no. we definitely need to keep things on the up and up. Or um, how about number three? Oh, 
Oh, here's a good one. Unlike most gated communities, muskets and especially musket fire are highly encouraged. Oh, dear. <laughs> wow. You know, that's a surprise to me because most HOAs are pre have a pretty dim view of muskets. Boy, yeah. that's a that's a that's a shocking, shocking revelation. But you're getting it right here from the Mormon News Roundup. But I hear <laughs> I hear that it's going to be highly encouraged to keep your own musket and have it ready to go. OK, how about number five? Um, this is exactly what Jesus taught. Hoard the widow's might in order to erect exclusive gated communities for the rich. Yeah, I don't know how you'd misinterpret that. Yeah, that picture is inspiring if you take a look at it, Rebecca. Yeah. And I yeah. snuck in for those, uh, the right meat for my uh, right uh, ring followers. I snuck in the Make America Great Again meme into that just <laughs> because I think it fits very well with this particular picture. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get a lot of trouble on this poll. How about uh, number six? Probably are. <laughs> oh, this is the perfect winter community for Glenn Beck, Tim Ballard, and Jody Arias. There wait, you go. Wait, wait, Jody. Wait, Gl okay, Glenn Beck. Okay, God, yeah, oh, sure. He can go visit there. Tim Ballard, I'd rather not. But Jody Arias? She is in Arizona, by the way. So. Right, already there. She is. A, you know, that is a hot pick, by the way. That's, that's yeah. a good pick. You know, that's... that's wow. Let's go well, to the next one, okay? Very, okay, let's keep on, <laughs> let's keep on going here. Okay, um, how everyone, about the next one? Oh, okay, everybody, everyone who buys a house is required to live the law of consecration. Mm. Except, Rebecca, those who have had their second annoying. Oh. That's a little loophole there. It is a, a loophole, of... and I feel like most people that will be able to afford this exclusive gated community will have had their second anointing. It seems to go hand in hand. It certainly does. How about number eight? Uh, the SEC has already pre-drafted the sanction letter for the fine that's going to go along with this project. Uh, get ahead of it. I love that. Yeah, you know, might as well just take care of it right away. They probably have a number of pre-drafted letters for the church just to uh, save time, I imagine. Um, I wish we had more time to show you that SEC letter, but, you know, we're just kind of running short on time here. How about number nine? Uh, Sports Illustrated swimsuit models are highly encouraged to move in. Well, of course. Absolutely. Empower Conference, Strength in Women, Dealing with the Challenges and Focus, a BYU Big 12 event that just happened at BYU a short time ago. And it used to be this Sports Illustrated swim Swimsuit Models. The church took a dim view of them. No, they are highly encouraged to move into this community. Okay. And finally, um, I thought you'd appreciate this one. Number 10. Oh, dear. There will be exclusive $250 per plate dinners held monthly at the community center where you can dine with the apostles. And uh, a little caveat there, unless you're a Mormonish uh, podcasting host. Yeah, I knew. It's not the first time we've been excluded, so we're used to it. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that would be that's going to be lit though. Every month there'll be an apostle there that you can rub shoulders with. It's definitely not going to be free though. There's, yeah. I mean, you got to recoup your costs and make a little extra, right? Yep, it's a fundraising for sure. effort for sure. Yeah, so this is our poll of the week here, uh, Rebecca. The top ten things you didn't know about the LDS Church's a hundred million dollar plus build to rent community in Arizona will be the will you please be the first person to take our poll. Well, I'm just going to have to go with number 10 because it specifically mentions Mormonish <laughs> and excludes us yet again. So, yes, that's my vote. Number 10. Uh, yes, uh, that's very, very nice. Uh, my personal uh, my personal favorite is number six. This is the perfect winter community for Glenn Beck, Tim Ballard <laughs> and Jody Arias. OK, uh, maybe not. OK, maybe not Jody Arias. You know, yeah. shout out to Jody, though, you know, that's uh, right. She, she is in Arizona, though, so um, maybe when she's released, actually, I don't think she's going to be. But yes, uh, uh, for those of you out there in the live chat, thanks for casting your vote. We really appreciate that. Let's keep this train running. Cut a couple of temple updates. We need to do these fast and furious here because the church always has a lot to, of news in the temple. So let's uh, do these in less than one minute. Uh, ground broken for Fort Worth, Texas Temple, one of eight in the state. And Rebecca, there's three in the Dallas Fort Worth uh, area already. And this is the third one. Do you think uh, they're the, all of those are uh, packed to the gills and uh, being used 24 seven? Um, oh, absolutely. I'm sure that's what they would love everybody to think. But I know anecdotally, we all know different. In fact, a friend of mine was at a attending award yesterday where they had told them that temple shifts, which used to be six hours, you know, that's how long you would go there and sign up to serve, um, were now being reduced to four hours. Now, I don't know if this is just their local temple area, but the leader was saying from the pulpit, the temple shift has been reduced. There's no reason we can't do it now. We need help in our temple district and the neighboring temple district needs help. So please, 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 everyone sign up. And I'm guessing if you were to talk to your viewers, um, a lot of them are hearing things like this, that there's an absolute desperate need for people to be working in the temple stretched very thin. 
Yeah, there's 83,000 members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the Fort Worth area. We'll say that uh, 40,000 of those are adults, and we'll say that uh, 15,000 of them um, ha have temple recommends, and then maybe 10,000 of them actually go to the temple. Yep. Um, okay, we need three temples for 10,000 yep. people. That's a big surprise to me. Uh, our next article here is uh, this is going to have to be quick on this one. A nonprofit, Rebecca, has uh, bought acreage in Heber City with the hope of turning it into a Book of Mormon-inspired sculpture garden. This is going to be like kind of like the ARC experience in Kentucky. You know what I mean? This is going to be like yep. Christian nationalism. This is going to be like yes. a like a weird science thing where you go to affirm your faith and, you know, it's going to be like, you know, those, this is one heck of a, a, an article here. What do you think about this fantasy park idea here in Heber? Well, I wonder if they're going to be hiring that Captain Moroni guy, right? He's already got his costume. I mean, <laughs> or is he in prison? I can't remember, but no, he'd be a great greeter at the beginning, right? With his title of Liberty waving it. So no, this, uh, the Christian nationalism in Mormonism is a really big issue. And it's sort of an undercurrent with all the things that are happening. I know a lot of podcasters, Mormonish included, are starting to look into that and what it might mean. And so to open, you know, to look online and see this, <laughs> I'm like, okay, here we go again, because it is, it's all wrapped up in a very pretty theme park. I mean, and I was raised on this stuff. Like I, my mom told me Moroni was in George Washington's tent directing, you know, uh, strategy for the Revolutionary War, Moroni, which I don't know, is that the greatest choice, you know, for somebody that went giving you battle advice? I'm not sure. But that was something that I grew up knowing as a fact. So it all plays into all of that, um, not just Mormon nationalism, but Christian nationalism. Um, it's a big issue. If your viewers have not looked into that, it's time to start looking into it. Okay, and we have one more temple update. Like I said, we only have one minute for each one of these. Plan recommended to build controversial LDS temple in Heber City. Let's play this one minute local news reaction to go along with this. An update to plans to build a temple for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Heber City. A planning commission recommended the plan to the Wasatch County Council for approval in a public hearing last night. Some church members spoke in support of the temple, while others brought up concerns over size and light pollution it would cause. The plus supply and demand, we have a huge demand for it because if every temple within two hours is booked, it shows that people are going to it and they want it. For that location, it's too tall, it's too big, it's going to be too bright. And that's what our signs say. Light pollution is pollution. Relupa doesn't apply. Uh, it's the wrong building with the wrong zoning. Part of the recommendation includes legislative agreement between the county and the church to work together to address the unique nature of the project. The commission also recommended the plan with certain conditions to mitigate the effect of the temple on light and green space in the area. The county council will consider the plan in a public hearing on November 8th. So the plan is in place here, Rebecca. It's been approved and um, it's a lot. It's getting closer and closer to being over the finish line. I know the Mormonish podcast, you have yeah. covered quite a bit on this. How do you feel about what's going on in Heber Valley? Yeah, I almost can't even speak. I'll try. That wonderful woman with the sign about the lighting, that is our friend Lisa. And she is part of the amazing citizens group. They are made of just incredible professionals that have done so much due diligence on this. And of course, it was passed. Of course, uh, they now have the go ahead to go ahead. But it's certainly not a done deal. There are huge issues around this. The biggest one is the aquifer and uh, pumping water away from the site. And and I'm telling yeah. you, as soon as that shovel goes in the ground, there's going to be a lot you're going to see happening with that, because that is a huge issue. The church is trying to downplay it. Not at all. And I will say that, you know, <laughs> they say that they have complied to all the zoning restrictions. They literally went into the county and changed the zoning restrictions as far as dark skies and heights of buildings, all those kinds of things that had been in place for 20 years. And they didn't just change it for the temple because that would look like, you know, some kind of preferential treatment. They changed the zoning for the entire area. Um, it's just, it's such a big story. I can't describe it in just a minute. But as you said, Mormonish Podcast has done, I think, three or four episodes on Cody and Heber. It's worth looking into. It's it's fascinating. Yeah, no one has covered the uh, Cody, Wyoming and Heber Valley temples better than the Mormonish Podcast. 
and we're certainly, if we had more time, we could delve more into it, mm -hmm. but we don't. So uh, head on over to Mormonish Podcasting Channel if you want to learn more about that, because I wish we had more time. Now, a couple, uh, our next article here, this is a, this is another big one. It's just such a huge week. It's incredible here. Amid, uh, this is from the Salt Lake Tribune, amid strong growth in missionaries and converts, the LDS Church plans a huge jump in the number of missions. This is this is fascinating here. The church has just announced 36 new missions that went from like 410 missions to 450 missions, including three additional missions in Utah, which will come online next year across the globe as the proselyting force surpasses pre-pandemic levels, topping 72,000 missionaries. You know, Rebecca, I know you have a missionary. One of your sons is out there right now. Um, how's your son feeling about all of this, his mission? And what do you think about the church announcing so many new missions? Yeah, he was really, really excited about it. And um, he, I talked to him FaceTime last week and he was really shocked that I knew about it. <laughs> I think he thinks I don't follow things like I do. He doesn't know. But yeah, it's, it's a very interesting development. Again, I believe it's sort of like a little numbers game, kind of like creating two wards out of one. And then both wards is, left saying, how am I supposed to run this ward with only 50 people in it? So I think it's a lot of juggling. Um, I think they're going to perhaps have fewer missionaries in each area because I think a lot of mission presidents are absolutely overwhelmed um, watching out for these kids. And so that's a good thing, I think. If kids can have more direct contact and oversight just to make sure they're okay, that's what I always worry about these missionaries. I also know that service missionaries are now being considered and called regular missionaries. It, it's kind of, have you heard this? Have you heard about this? That now service missionaries are going to, in the past, let me see if I can explain this correctly. They used to report to their state president, right? That's who was had oversight over them as they lived at home and performed their duties of a service mission. Now they're more integrated into the regular mission. So the mission president in the mission now has oversight over a service missionary. And the, and those service missionaries will attend zone conferences. They will be in oh. the loop on things like this. Now, I'm hearing this anecdotally from service missionaries that I know, but I feel like this makes sense. Now they, they don't, I think when they report things, they're not going to say service missionaries, senior couples, and missionaries. I think they're just going to say missionaries. Does that make sense? Yeah, because so a lot of- It's a numbers a lot of game. Yeah, a lot of service missionaries are only serving part time in a limited mm -hmm. capacity at mm -hmm. either at a bishop's storehouse doing mm -hmm. indexing, maybe at a family history center. And those are considered service missionaries. If you're going to integrate them as part of the process and uh, make them more a part of the proselyting force, perhaps in an effort to get more usage out of them and increase their uh, volunteer hours. That would make sense if it was going along with this change. Now, mm -hmm. the church tweeted out um, this uh, particular, uh, let me show the church's official handle here, which is at Church Jesus Christ to accommodate the rising number of missionaries now at more than 72,000. They will open 36 new missions. Um, this is going to put the total number of missions there up to 450. And somebody, um, <laughs> the, the, the church is claiming here significant growth is the reason behind the new missions. Presumably, we are supposed to uh, take away Away from that, that the church is growing, that we're, we're having so many more converts, more people are joining the church. And that's the reason that we need all of these and that there's more missionaries in the mission field. And that's the reason that we need so many more um, uh, mission. The, that's why we need so many more missions. But the fact of the matter is, is that we have not gotten back to the high of the missions, which uh, the church plateaued at somewhere around 90,000, about five years ago, the church plateaued. Mm -hmm. Uh, at about 90,000 mission, missionaries. The convert baptisms has absolutely not gone up and it's it's either plateaued or slightly decreased over time. So it's like the, the church's metrics here are saying, yes, things are going so incredibly well that we need all these new missions. That's not the entire story here. No, it's not. Again, it's just optics. It's like announcing temples. When you announce a temple, everyone assumes there's incredible growth there. And that's why we're having a temple. It's a, it's a sign of growth missions and opening missions and then kind of explaining these numbers in kind of a wiggly way that makes it sound like there's a lot of convert baptisms. That is not what's happening. But something new makes it sound like something is happening. A new ward, right? When in reality, it's shuffling around in the stake. A stake is closed. A few new wards have opened. I mean, it's very hard to track and it takes a lot of time. But I believe that's what's going on behind the scenes.
Yeah, one of my favorite Twitter accounts is at the Culch News, which is a parody account of the <laughs> Church News here. And he fixed the tweet that says, to give the appearance that the Church of Jesus Christ is growing because growth has slowed to a trickle, the church is going to announce all of these new missions. This um, mm -hmm. is going to be the highest number in church history. A couple of other reactions here. The church announced the 36 missions and also the increase the amount of time allowed to start the paperwork. Yes. I believe it was six months in advance was the maximum amount of time. I believe that that has been increased uh, now to, um, I think it's up to a year. Uh, I may have to check my facts on that, but uh, yes. And then finally, one other uh, uh, Twitter reaction here. There's things that the church can control. They can control temples. They can control mm -hmm. the number of missions. Things yep. they cannot control is weekly attendance, formal resignations, and the percent of membership that is active. They have the data to report on all of this. You'll never get wi guess which ones they choose to share. Yep. So the only the only data that we get is the things that the church can control: number of missions, uh, you know, uh, uh, number of temples. But we don't get to hear the most important factors, which is, uh, you know, butts and seats and the percentage of people who actually consider themselves to be Latter Day Saints. Yep. We don't get the most important information. No, we don't. And like that tweet said, or that post said, they have those numbers. They could tell us those numbers. And a lot of people have extrapolated those numbers. We had Dr. Randy Bell on our podcast um, to talk about Faith Matters Restore. I think you covered that with Patrick Mason. But, you know, he's, that's what he does. He crunches numbers. He understands how these things work. And he, <laughs> oh my gosh, he, he told us the most shocking figure. He said, if you add everything up, if you crunch everything up, the number of actual temple recommend in holding Mormons, those that have a temple recommend is somewhere between, and this is worldwide, 800,000 and a million. That's like, shockingly low. And he had this whole, shockingly low. And he had this whole algorithm, you know, I, I can't explain it, but I do trust him because this is what he does for a living. He's known as the master of disaster. And he goes in and he assesses scenes and collateral damage and he crunches the numbers. And he literally said 800,000 to a million active temple recommend holders worldwide. That was just, our jaws hit the floor on that. Well, if we want to talk about real numbers, the, the one of the best ways uh, the, to check churches' health is the percentage of actual members who are currently on a mission. And back in the 90s, that percent of actual members peaked at around 1%. Right now, the percentage of all members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who are on a mission is approximately 0.3%. So it's a 200% decrease in the percentage of people who are going on a mission. Okay, so that's not exactly a, a wonderful bill of health. And this, uh, uh, this uh, I have also this other tweet here. This is what we're seeing in the church is that they're sending a smaller percentage of kids on missions. We're riding a wave up of potential missionaries that's following a wave down. So basically, you know, the number of missionaries really tracks with the number of people who were blessed 19 years ago. OK, mm -hmm. so if you think about 19 years ago, the church was, uh, you know, late uh, 19 years ago, 2002. Mm -hmm. That's when the church really started to decline in the growth rate. So what we're going to see. So we've been riding a wave up um, and now we're going to be seeing a, a riding of a wave down as yep. the 19 year olds from uh, 19 years ago. That percentage is less and less. You know what I mean? It's not about going on a mission is a lot about who gets blessed 19 years ago. It's yeah. not as much about how the people feel about it. It's just uh, uh, how many babies you have. Yeah. It's, it's pure numbers. And that's why I feel eventually they'll stop announcing number of missionaries and just talk about the missions themselves. We have this many missions. You don't know how many people are in there. You don't know how many people are being baptized, but you do right. know a number of missions, which like temples is a controllable um, figure. And so you do need to pay attention on what they report and even more attention <laughs> to what they don't report because that's where the truth is. Yeah. So think about back in 2017, 46%, according to these calculations, 46% of people who could go on a mission were going on a mission. Back in 2018, it dropped to 43%. 2019, 42%. 2020, 35%. 2021, 38%. It's been hovering at around, like I said, around that same figure of about 38 to 40% of people who go on a mission, who can go on a mission will. And of course, not all of them actually finish the mission. So Correct. probably around 30% of people, and some of those are certain service missionaries, which are only serving part-time. I mean, the amount of people going on a mission who actually complete a full proselytizing service mission, I would not be surprised at all if it was around 25%. So mm -hmm. the church is masking the numbers here of the issues that it's having of recruiting people to go into the mission field, because we've seen from the last couple of years, especially in North America, 
the church has only grown in the United States like 50,000 people in the last two years. Right. And there's a huge number of missionaries in America. They're hearing the stories from the people who went before them of saying, I I'm, I'm working a lot of effort here yeah. and getting absolutely no return. I'm incredibly yeah. frustrated. People, the rise of religious seculariz uh, secularization in the United States is making it almost impossible for people to want to join this quirky religion that has an incredible amount of polygamous baggage and other issues. Yeah. People are seeing that and not wanting to go on mission. So what do we do to respond to it? We're going to decrease the amount of missionaries in each mission, which, as you yes. said, is a really good idea because then you yeah. have more supervision from um, church leaders and more support. I think that's a great cause, but just masking the entire thing. A any last thoughts on this? No, I think you hit it on the head and they'll just get up at the pulpit and proudly announce more temples and more missions and more openings of wards. And everybody, probably most of our relatives included, will think everything is well in Zion. So yes. it's hard to dig into it. It's hard, but it's worth it if you really yeah, want to. It is hard because on. the church refuses to release the proper numbers that help mm -hmm. um, people have an informed decision as to whether they mm -hmm. want to go on a mission in the first place. Saying, here's how many baptisms you can expect in your mission. Here's how many uh, missionaries in this mission got sick, got 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 hurt last year. Mm -hmm. How many came mm -hmm. home? How many had mental health issues? Uh, you know, uh, data on the mission president. How do people feel about this mission president? You know, there could be so much more informed consent with the mission and um, this, uh, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> okay, it is couple, what it is. <laughs> yeah, a couple quick. Uh, uh, we got the BYU corner here, and these are we got to go through these pretty quickly. Sixty second uh, articles here. You know, with the uh, the the terrible tragedy that happened in um, early October in in Israel with uh, Hamas killing all of those people. You know, the church sent everyone, uh, all of the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints who were at the Jerusalem Center. They were sent home, and it took them a while to get over to Greece because they couldn't get direct flights out of Israel. But now, just a couple of days ago, the church released that the BYU Jerusalem Center students are now leaving Greece and will finish their semester from home. My understanding is that virtually all of them are back to their home uh, situations. Any thoughts on the um, on, on this one? Well, I was just really to ha happy to hear about that because I thought of COVID, right? And I thought of how many missionaries were trapped because the church did not act fast enough and realize we've got to get these people out. I mean, I personally know people that, you know, the parents were trying to book their own flights out during COVID. I mean, it, it had the potential to be a, a real disaster for all these young people. So I was happy that the church was able to act quickly because it does take a while to mobilize and get people out and they must have jumped on it right away. So thank goodness, because I think there could have been some big problems had they not been extricated. Yeah, I, I haven't read anything that says that anybody has been stranded or anybody has mm -hmm. been caught up in it. And it seems like everybody has been taken care of. And that's a really positive step. A couple of other uh, uh, spots here from BYU. You know, you're familiar with the Daily Universe, which is the BYU's official newspaper um, sanctioned by the church. But you also have the somewhat fringe right wing Cougar Chronicle. Mm -hmm. And uh, according to this information here, thanks to our reporting, responsible action has ensured that the CAPS, which is the psychological, the Office of Psych Psychology uh, Service Services uh, at BYU, it's no longer going to disseminate the LGBTQ activism guide. So they've managed to get the update here is that the BYU CAPS office has removed the activism guide, meaning the particular resources from the counseling and psychological services here um, that were available for LGBTQ students since BYU has been loath to provide um, any type of support to those particular students. Thanks to the Cougar Chronicle, those students now will not have access to that uh, particular guide. No, of course not. <laughs> I went to BYU. I worked at BYU. And yeah, I'm not surprised at all. In fact, I was talking to somebody the other day that was a professor that had been really instrumental in trying to get guidelines for students um, to tell them how you could report something if something had happened to you, if there had been some abuses or, you know, because we've had stories in the news recently of professors, well, kind of starting sex cults and uh, abusing students. So this professor, a friend of mine was talking about, yeah, we put all these guidelines in place. We took it through several departments. It was supposed to be a little guide that was given to incoming freshmen that would tell them if you see something or something happens, here's where you go. Here's who you, how you report it. Well, just like this article, that was taken out of what was given to new freshmen. They do not want people to report things or to get help because they don't want to raise awareness to any of these issues that are there. I think that's it. I mean, I still like to think, okay, they do care about people. They just don't want to make it easier for people, um, you know, to try to shine a spotlight on some of these things that are going on that might uh, make some changes. So yeah, it's disheartening. Absolutely. 
Yeah, a couple of other lots. BYU corner here. You know, BYU just uh, yeah, yesterday highlights key plays and photos from BYU's blowout loss to West Virginia. The football <laughs> team has lost once again, Rebecca, oh. and they um are Dang having it. a they are having a rough go of it. You know, the, the BYU football team just uh, joined the a Big Twelve conference, yeah. a new conference there, and they're coming to realize that hey, you know, we're not playing Utah State anymore. These yeah. these football teams are really really <laughs> good in the Big Twelve. There's a reason that that's a power conference. Yeah. And, um, you know, they're having a rough go of it. it does remind me of this meme here that I, I, you know, Rebecca, I don't always rise and shout, but when I do, the Cougars are out. There hasn't been much rising and shouting with the BYU football program as of late, though. No, there hasn't. And it's funny because ever since I was little, I heard that this is God's football team, right? Didn't you hear that? This is the Lord's team. So I just don't understand why the Lord has a team that's performing like this. It's very, I mean, I my freshman year was 1984, if you guys know what that means, right? We were number one. It was absolutely incredible. Finally, God's team did something. It's kind of been a sliding down the hill since then, I think. Yeah, that's unfortunate. So, uh, well, I'm, I'm not the biggest sports fan like I uh, used to be. I used to watch every single game, but I guess I just haven't been watching it quite as well as I should have. But uh, yeah, they're having a rough go, but we'll keep an eye on it for everybody. And that does bring us, uh, Rebecca, to our featured article of the week here. The Tim Ballard scandal is getting absolutely crazy. I mean, this is just getting this is blowing off the net here. I've got a I've got a, a quick summary of this for you here that was uh, released by KUTD News, which will try to give us a, a basic overview of what's happening with the Tim Ballard situation this week. Hey, we do start with breaking news off of two news at six tonight off the top. New allegations today in a lawsuit filed by several women against Tim Ballard in Operation Underground Railroad. Thanks for being with us for two news at six. I'm Mark Cabell. And I'm Heidi Hatch. The new allegations involve a top leader for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and also Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes. Tim Ballard, the founder and former leader of Our Foundation, faces civil suits filed by multiple women who worked with him. The women allege that he would manipulate them and coerce them into sexual acts as part of his trafficking rescue missions with Operation Underground Railroad. In an amended complaint filed yesterday, attorneys for the women say, quote, LDS elder M. Russell Ballard and other authorities from the Mormon church provided Mormon tithing records to OUR to help OUR target wealthy donors and wealthy Mormon church wards. What? It goes on to say that Attorney General Sean Reyes would intimidate the complainants, saying upon learning of these complaints, Attorney General Sean Reyes would step in and rather than investigate what OUR and Tim Ballard were doing, would intimidate those complainants. Now, Elder M. Russell Ballard is not related to Tim Ballard, but did at some point work with the support of the efforts of OUR. In September, the church released a statement accusing Tim Ballard of explo exploiting his friendship with senior Apostle Ballard, calling the former OUR leader's actions morally unacceptable. Okay, so like she said, Rebecca, this is an update from the lawsuit that was filed two yep. weeks ago. We have amended an update with new allegations, which are really, really interesting. What's your first thoughts here of watching this news clip? Well, I have to laugh because uh, as we prepared for the news through the week to, to air today, you know, we had lots of really big stories and we thought, okay, we've got it down. Suddenly, Friday, <laughs> all this happened. So um, I don't think anything could surprise me anymore. There are a lot of really great podcasts that jumped on this right away. RFM read all the amended complaints and information. You have to kind of extrapolate it out of the original. So he went to great lengths to do that. That is an excellent podcast that aired last night. John DeLynn was on it right away with a live broadcast just a few hours after it came out. Um, but there are some very disturbing things there, especially about the tithing. I think that's one of the bigger things to come out. That is, I, we've I could never heard believe, anything like that. No, I could not believe what I was seeing there. But I, I want to put a caveat. That's not, I have heard of this before with Elder Wilkinson at BYU back in the 60s, he mm. asked the church headquarters for the tithing receipts of every single BYU faculty member and staff member. It was around 800 to 1,000 at the time. And church headquarters did provide that to him. Then he compared their salary with how much tithing that That's they right. had paid before and called them into the office and put pressure on people who were not full tithe payers. So to say this is <laughs> unprecedented is not quite there because we have seen this happen before. 
Yeah, I, I actually forgot about that. Thank you for reminding me. I'll have something else to be grumpy about today. But interestingly, in a Salt Lake Tribune article, the church's response to this, that specific thing, was simply to refer them to the handbook. And I wish I had the quote with me from the handbook, but it basically outlines. Oh, go ahead. I do have that. I do have that for you. So let me let me cue that up here in a second. Oh, yeah. Let, let me let me cue that up. That's a good point. Yes, the handbook talks about what we're supposed to do with Titan. Let me let me just cover that in a moment. Exactly. So, so the first thing here. And it basically here, outlines everything that, if true, Elder Ballard has done completely wrong, and it could be a disciplinary offense. Yeah. So that's uh, that's what they. Uh, I got this from. Uh, you know, it's it's rules for thee, but not for me. Because if you look in the Church's mm -hmm. Handbook of Instruction under thirty four point four, it says the confidentiality of tithing and other offerings. And let me just read this to you. Uh, this is exactly what you were saying, Rebecca. The amount of tithing and other offerings paid by a donor is confidential. Only the bishop and those who are authorized to handle or view these contributions should have access to this information. Stake presidencies, bishoprics, and clerks should never inappropriately discuss mm -hmm. a member's tithing status, nor should they discuss the total amount of tithing or others received. Mm -hmm. um, this, what this allegation says, is that um, you know Tim Ballard wanted access to rich Mormon donors, but he didn't know where to start, so he asked his bosom friend. President Ballard for the tithing receipts of wealthy Mormons so that he could target them for fundraising yeah. for his allegedly uh, illicit or illegal operations, which didn't actually rescue anyone. This is absolutely reprehensible. Yeah, and, and I've been kind of um, looking at post-Mormon sites where former ward tithing clerks and people involved with finance are posting, and they're saying, oh, yes, it was very clear to us that there was any breach of confidentiality with the money, you know, they would face discipline. They would definitely face something like that. So that brings into question uh, Elder Ballard's role, I think, in that. I also feel like this could play into some of the lawsuits, the Huntsman lawsuit and the new lawsuit that we just discussed today, if true, because you could possibly argue, the whole argument of those tithing lawsuits is, had I known blank, I would never have paid tithing. Had I known my personal information, wow. my income, Perhaps my phone number, my address, my contact right. information would have been given to a third party to solicit something I never would have paid or not paid in the same way. So I kind of feel it could play in. Wow, that is a great insight. Um, let me let me show you from the actual, we don't have time to read the entire lawsuit, but here's the three most important parts of it, in my opinion, from the amended update. And that's from uh, Complaint 71. It said the Davis County investigation, according to OUR's own internal documents, revealed that Elder M. Russell Ballard and other authorities from the Mormon Church provided Mormon tithing records to OUR to help OUR target wealthy donors and wealthy Mormon church wards. So that's a, uh, that's allegation number one. That's mm -hmm. right from the lawsuit. Allegation number two, the Davis County attorney, Troy Rawling, Rawlings, alleged that LDS apostle, Elder M. Russell Ballard's son-in-law, is involved in investing in OUR's money, and Elder Ballard and his family is benefiting from the investments. That is absolutely shocking. And here's the third one, Exhibit J. Davis County Attorney Troy Rawlings alleged that he had evidence that Elder Ballard and or other LDS Church authorities had provided LDS Church tithing records to OUR to help them target large donors or wealthy LDS Church wards. So it's not just Elder Ballard who's in the mm -hmm. hot, according to this complaint. They supposedly have evidence and exhibits of other LDS Church authorities who provided your confidential tithing receipts to this allegedly quack organization. I mean, it'd be, it'd be bad enough if you were giving them to, I don't know, a Doctors Without Borders or, or, or a legitimate other charity. You know, that, that would be bad enough. But we're providing them yeah. to OUR, which is mm -hmm. a reprehensible and disgusting organization, which is engaged in so much fraud and deceit. This is just, you know, it just makes my blood boil, to be honest with you. I can tell. We're all riled up. But here's what's interesting. The whole time from the very first statement in Vice, the church has tried to completely distance itself from OUR and Tim Ballard. Oh, he had a slight relationship with Elder Ballard, but that's over. Nothing more. And yet more and more keeps coming out to show this absolute hand in glove relationship with the church. I mean, some of these allegations say other authorities. And there, there is some information that there are other apostles um, you know, that knew about this and supported this. Elder Anderson's name came yes. up in an email. Um, Razvan yes. Renlin, I think like that. And here's, here's the biggest piece that I can't get over. Just last week in a ward in Texas, um, OUR 
and its CEO, uh, Matt Osborne, gave a fireside to adults in the ward and anybody over 14 who was a, a, um, accompanied by a parent teaching them how not to fall for grooming, how not to, you know, it had this list of things. So you don't just get to give a fireside. The church has to be on board. The bishop has to okay it. The stake president has to okay it. I'm sure it goes higher than that. So OUR and the church continue to have this relationship. The church seems to indicate it's totally fine with OUR and whatever it's teaching and doing goes into the ward and talk to as young as 14, vulnerable, right? Yeah. I feel like there's this whole undercurrent of something. Why are they promoting this? Why do they want their members to hear this? It's bigger than this, I think. But I was I was stunned to hear that, that just last week they gave a yeah. fireside. We did cover that on the Mormon News Roundup. So it's not like, hey, we thought Tim Ballard was a great guy and we we put him forward. The moment that we found out something's wrong, we distanced ourselves. No, he's still mm -hmm. the OUR is still being um, brought up in, in local uh, in local churches in, in Texas, as you mentioned. You know, and Elder Ballard himself this week, he had uh, the church release this, that the church... Um, uh, he, he was sent to the hospital with respiratory issues here just this week. Um, I can only imagine that this entire situation has caused him a great deal of pause. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to have uh, Enos Envy on the podcast here in about a month. He uh, tweeted this out. He said, well, I'd have breathing problems too if I was legitimately accused of all of these incredibly deceptive behaviors. Um, because President Ballard was also... The, the acting president of the 12 when the church was fined $5 million from the SEC. President Ballard seems to be involved, as we've seen from the reporting from Lynn Packard and others, seems to be involved in all of these incredible scandals and has taken absolutely no accountability for his role in any of it. Yeah, no, and, and we know that he introduced Tim Ballard to the Q15. We know there was a meeting where, you know, he outlined OUR and everything that they could do and tried to get everybody on board. I almost feel like this is business as usual for Elder Packer, if, or sorry, Elder Ballard, if you look into <laughs> just his history and who he is. Um, but I feel like now in the 21st century, with that spotlight and the internet, it can't be business as usual. This stuff will come to light eventually. And I think there'll be more. I know there'll be more. Probably next week, you'll be talking about more and saying, I can't believe we thought last week was, <laughs> was yeah. something. Look at this week. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, you know, Tim Ballard was investigated by Davis County, and it appears that he might have been shielded from the mm -hmm. repercussions of his allegedly illegal activities uh, because uh, Davis County prosecutors uh, didn't turn up anything and didn't um, bring any charges because of his incredibly cozy relationship with Sean Reyes, who's the Utah Attorney General, who's also an active member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There's a timeline of their relationship, but the GOP office holders' ties with the founder of Operation Underground Railroad have led legislators to consider how the state's top law enforcement officer is chosen. So it's not just that Elder Ballard is having a cozy mm -hmm. relationship with Tim Ballard, but other prominent mm -hmm. members of the church are really, I don't know if you want to say concealing or enabling or are helping this uh, OUR continue to perpetuate it's allegedly illicit activities, which include sexual abuse to women, which include, um, you know, bilking donors for money that was never allegedly never used to help anyone. This why do people in top Mormon leadership continue to prop someone up in this way when it is evident to almost everyone who's around this that this entire thing is built on a sham? Yeah, I think they might be susceptible, perhaps. It's sort of like affinity fraud, right? I think there's a great deal of naivety. But uh, one of the biggest things I think to come out was the email from Glenn Beck, exactly right here. Now, this was sent the day after um, the Vice article statement from the church denouncing Tim Ballard. And this, this to me shows like you said, who's involved. So Glenn Beck is sending this email to Tim Ballard and everyone's trying to figure out what's going on. What's happening with this, this, de this denouncing statement from the church. So who's listed in here? Glenn Beck says, I instantly got a hold of Elder Anderson, right? Well, why, if the church has nothing to do with this, why would you contact Elder Anderson? He'd been out of the country. He doesn't know what's going on. Um, also Mike Lee, you know, he's going to weigh in Sean Reyes. You see right there, this kind of network, this insulation that is around Tim. And at this point, on this day of the email, nobody knows. They all think perhaps this email was sent not by the church, but by somebody that was out to get Tim. And they're talking about, you know, stay strong, brother, and you know your destiny. And I'm going to get information from Elder Anderson, and we've got to make sure we've got our ducks in a row. So 
this is a glimpse. I'm sure only the tip of the iceberg um, to the amount of insulation that Tim has with all of these people politically and religiously. I mean, Utah is sort of a theocracy and, and this is how it works. They all work together. So this email was very telling. Of course, <laughs> I went through the timeline last night and my co-host and I were looking at it. So this email is sent. Then there's some tweets from um, Glenn Beck saying, oh my gosh, my church would not do this, would not do that. Then, okay, so those went out at midnight. By the next morning, a different tune from Glenn Beck. He's writing, well, let's wait and see. So we kind of surmise in between those hours, he probably got a hold of Elder Anderson and Elder Anderson had gotten a hold of the church, was now in the know and they were going, oh no. Yeah, <laughs> There's Glenn something Beck else going on here. Yeah, Glenn Beck took those tweets. He changed his, uh, he's yeah. changed his tune very rapidly. Yeah. You know and then I mean? distance himself once then he dug in and looked into it and, and put his own reporters on it. So then he did say, OK, I've been duped. I believe the allegations. But just seeing the process and seeing who they reached out to, who were they all in bed with together, so to speak? <laughs> That's that email. I'm going to find out from Elder Anderson. He is going to ask the brethren. So Elder Anderson knows. Some of the brethren know because he's going to check with them for information. We're going to bring Mike Lee in. We're going to have Sean Reyes. It's just very interesting. You know, don't, it, it, Rebecca, if I could just say one thing, don't use Tim Ballard and get in bed with in the same sentence. I know, I knew mind. as soon as I said it, I shouldn't have okay. said it. I apologize. Because <laughs> um, I, I don't know what level of consent would be necessary, but it would be an extremely high level. That's all I can say. Um, But yeah, you know, you know, can you call an LDS apostle on Saturday and demand answers? Well, you can if you're a rich conservative conspiracy theorist. You know, the people who have access to apostles are not you and me, Rebecca. They're not members of the church. There are rich folks who are associated with those high power positions. It's um, you have to be at a certain threshold in order to interact with the quorum of the fifteen. And this brings um, that brings it uh, uh, four to mind. Is all I can say. You know, one other tweet that went along with this. This is from uh, uh, Jezebel. She said, "Mormons, I know the gospel is true because the Spirit told me. I don't need evidence. I have faith." Also Mormons, I need evidence that the Glenn Beck email is real. There's not enough evidence that the apostles were colluding with the government officials to cover up for Tim Ballard. Uh, I find that uh, type of hypocrisy very amusing. Mm -hmm. Yep, you got to choose your evidence. Whatever works for your narrative, that's what you have to go with. Yeah, and we also have not only that, we have from this uh, uh, from this lawsuit also, multiple sources have confirmed to Lynn Packer that an associate of Utah General Sean Reyes has a video from a 2019 party at his home in Bountiful, Utah, where they're doing lines of cocaine off of uh, naked women's legs. Um, it, it's amazing if you're all involved in this incredible fraud together, everybody is, um, everybody is dirty, then you all just kind of cover up for one another. You know, Sean Reyes covers for Tim. Tim cover, covers for Elder Ballard. Elder Ballard covers for everybody. It's just one big mm -hmm. bosom party here. Um, and it's just incredible. But I feel like it's a house of cards. I mean, you can see it like a Jenga game starting to unravel as people scramble. You can, And by the way, that's a very interesting uh post that you just, can you send that to me after the show? I need to look at that some more. I had sure. not seen that lines of Coke off and naked. I mean, I'm not surprised by anything that I hear now, but it is a house of cards. And, and I feel that we're just going to see it tumble and tumble, whether you want to see it or not. Like you said, some people will not see it no matter how real it is, but I think it's important to have eyes wide open to all of it. Yep. And here's Tim Ballard with Mike Lee. He was named mm -hmm. in these documents along with mm -hmm. all of these power players as well. They're all just uh, bosom friends. They're all high priests in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And, um, you know, he's in on the gravy train, too. Everybody wants to get a piece of the action and, uh, uh, you know, capitalize on the fundraising of Tim Ballard's uh, incredible popular name of the Sound of Freedom movie. If I can get in on the money, that that's what I want to do. And that's what was alleged with uh, uh, President Ballard, too, mm -hmm. that he was going to be investing, uh, I think, $200,000 into the either Operation Underground Railroad or the Spear Fund in order to gain returns for, on the investment. Everybody just wants in on the money. You know, it's just incredible, the money that goes along with this. And think about this from Floodlet. According to Tim Ballard, he presented the couple's ruse plan to Elder M. Russell Ballard, who thought that it was brilliant and specifically sanctioned the strategy. We get that from page yeah. 11 of the amended update. So far from being a reprehensible, what did he say? Um, a reprehensible activity. What did Elder Ballard say? He said that it was... Um, inappropriate or something um, the allegation yeah, is that he morally yeah. unacceptable morally yeah. unacceptable he said that he was totally on board with it 
Yeah. Well, and I also feel that perhaps the way Tim explained it, um, it might have made sense, you know, but but again, in practice and the abuses baked into this ruse, uh, there was no way it couldn't just go horribly, horribly wrong. So I perhaps say Elder Ballard being much older might not quite have understood what Tim was alluding to. But, well, people are saying, well, yeah. Elder Ballard is uh, the third in line to the church presidency. Mm -hmm. Why didn't he use the gift of discernment to figure yeah. out that Elder Ballard was up to no good? And people said, well, actually, he doesn't have the gift of discernment. He has the grift of discernment. <laughs> it's very oh, that's similar. Terrible. That's terrible. But that does bring up a question that my co-host Landon and I were talking about as we you know, prepared to podcast about this. He is third in line and there are failing health issues, perhaps, of the other two. What if? In a year or so, he is the prophet. Could he be the prophet with all of this happening and what could come out? Is there any mechanism within the church to have someone step away, you know, in an emeritus way to just kind of, uh, it's really interesting. We've not seen anything like this before. No, we haven't. And um, just to make sure that people say, know that there was a significant relationship between Tim Ballard and President Ballard. Here we have uh, Tim Ballard in his official capacity, excuse me, here we have President Ballard in his official capacity at BYU-Idaho giving a devotional yep. where he's talking about Tim Ballard and, prop, and propping him up and Tim yep. Ballard's allegedly cozy relationship with the prophet Nephi from the Book of Mormon. I had the opportunity this past summer to travel to Plymouth, Massachusetts with my friend Tim Ballard <laughs> to learn more about what he had learned regarding Nephi's vision of these early pilgrims and how their history corroborates Nephi's vision. Okay, so uh, President Ballard, did you pray about this talk before you gave it? If you didn't pray about it, then what good are you? Because if you're not praying about talk and giving us divine information at a BYU devotional, then you don't serve a purpose. But if you did pray about it, so God confirmed that we're supposed to bring Tim Ballard up. See, this is the entire problem. Yeah. There's just no way. Well, there's no answer to this. If you prayed about it, then then God is confirming that we're supposed to be trotting out Tim Ballard. And if you didn't pray about it, then what good are you? That's the entire that's the entire yeah. rub here. It's the conundrum. And I'm glad that you showed that quote because I came across that article, you know, last month because, you know, when the church is trying to distance themselves, you obviously go out and say, oh, no, here's this article. Here are these books at Deseret Book. Here's this speech of BYU Idaho. Now, this was on the church's website for a long time. Like I would check back every week to say, is that speech still there? Because he clearly says he's learning about Nephi from Tim Ballard. And of course, all of us are saying, oh, does that mean that he said to Elder Ballard, hey, my psychic told me about Nephi and here's what you need to know. It's very interesting. So just yesterday, I saw a post saying that article has now been scrubbed from the church website. So that is gone. Luckily, of course, you know, Wayback Machine has saved it. You have clips, but yet the church has now taken that down. Yeah, and here they are on tour together in, mm -hmm. I believe, Boston, where yeah. President Ballard and Tim Ballard are bosom friends once again. Uh, yeah. And they seem to be, the allegation is that they're also business associates and that, um, you know, it's just, you know, I, I just would expect, what I expect is something a little bit better from somebody who claims to be a prophet, seer, and revelator than palling around with sexual deviants who are continually um, defrauding people of their money in the name of the Lord. That's just what I expect. That's a base level of what I expect a prophet, seer, and revelator to do. And the problem is, is that we're not at that level yet. No, we're not. And again, I, I ask, is there any mechanism to handle something like this? You know, this PR nightmare of somebody who's so high up, who is in line to be the prophet. What do you do? I, I don't know. I can only imagine that the church's PR and lawyers are around the clock whiteboarding it. Probably. Do you think they have a well, whiteboard? I think they might. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of legendary whiteboards associated. What there is, yeah, Rebecca, exactly. there is a mechanism to remove church leaders, even the prophet. It's called the Common Council of the Church, and it's been convened twice. It was convened for Sylvester, excuse me, it was, it was convened for Sidney Rigdon because he okay. was a member of the first presidency when he apostatized because he did not yeah. follow the... Um, he started his own religion basically after the, uh, yeah. after Joseph Smith was killed. So they convened the Common Council of the Church and they excommunicated Sidney Reagan. That's it right. was also convened on Joseph Smith once in the Zions Camp debacle afterwards. That's I right. believe it was Sylvester Smith who brought up the Common Council of the Church and Joseph Smith was exonerated. So we do have the Common Council of the Church that does have the ability to have church action to remove an apostle who is not a representative of Jesus Christ. It hasn't been convened in, in any time since the death of Joseph Smith, but there is a mechanism. Wow. That would be something, wouldn't it? 
I mean, honestly, that would be something. You know, but I just looked this up, uh, Rebecca. You know, we're going to wrap this one up here soon. But if you go into the BYU website, even today, the BYU bookstore, which is one of my favorite bookstores, by the way, I have a lot of great oh, memories in the BYU bookstore. So I do them. I. So do yeah. I. Love the BYU bookstore. Um, but, uh, you know, if you go on there, guess what? Slave Stealers, True Accounts of Slave Rescues Then and Now, it's still on there. Now, these books have been taken off of Deseret Books, but guess what? BYU, they didn't get the memo that uh, Tim Ballard isn't the guy that you're supposed to be um, selling his books. Oops. Wow. I, that's very, did you go find that? I'm impressed. Mm -hmm. That's amazing because I've been looking for books too. No, but again, Fireside still in LDS wards, books still at the BYU bookstore. I feel like they're have the illusion of distance from OUR, but I don't think they really want to distance themselves. I don't think so. And I think it might have to do with sort of a undercurrent of Mormon nationalism and I think it all ties in. I am becoming a conspiracy theorist looking into all this. I swear, the more you have me on, the crazier I'll sound as we go forward. <laughs> but you can't help but wonder when you see all these things come out. It's just incredible. Well, if you go right, that's really good because people keep accusing me of going left. So that way we'll, well be nice. nice no, we'll, 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 balance. Yeah, that'll be a nice balance. That's perfectly acceptable. <laughs> Now, our final, yeah, like we said, um, you know, if you want an access to an apostle, you either have to pay $250 of mm -hmm. plate dinners to it, or you have to be a wealthy person like Tim Ballard, who is hobnobbing and, um, you know, bringing lots of uh, fame and fortune to the church. Those are the people who have access to apostles. Or um, this is our last article of the week here. And oh. Rebecca, you found this, this is Donnie Osmond yeah. and, and his wife, Susan. Um, for our podcast listeners out there, um, what are we seeing here? Well, it looks like Donny Osmond, who I was a huge fan of growing up, of course, and his wife have invited Elder Bednar and his wife um, to a wonderful dinner. But I, I think a lot of people were commenting on just kind of the unusual placement. They seem to be sitting really far apart. We wondered if if when uh, he entered, Elder Bednar entered the room, everybody had to stand up. It, it just raised a lot of questions, but <laughs> the food looks really good. I will say that as I look at that, as I look at that picture. So an interesting dinner. And, you know, I have heard anecdotally uh, from people connected to upper levels and, and the apostles that, you know, especially back in the heyday of the Osmonds, the apostles were absolutely gaga over the Osmonds, like just had an absolute, almost juvenile crush on them. You know, if they would be invited to Osmond events or have the Osmonds come to things, they were just absolutely starstruck over the Osmonds. And so I think that perhaps continues today. Yeah. If you're famous, if you have a lot of money, then you get access to the senior apostles of the church, or if you pay $250 for a per plate dinner, if you're a lowly member of the church or a seedless podcaster like myself, you don't get access to the apostles yeah. of the church. I do find it interesting here that uh, Donnie and his wife, they both have their cell phones out on the table, but uh, Susan yeah. and David, they don't. And just a couple of last things here. It says, uh, Donnie tweeted out, Debbie and I had the wonderful privilege of hosting Elder Bednar and his wife Susan at one of my shows last week. He's one of 12 apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, so you can see why I use the word privilege. I do find it interesting that it's always Elder Bednar and his wife Susan. It's not Susan and David. Susan yeah. could never be put into this sentence yeah. first. It's not Susan yeah. and David. It's Elder Bednar and his wife Susan, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And I have to say my co-host Landon made a great comment on this when he read it. It said, so you can see why I use the word privilege. He said, I think we should put a D on that, privileged, which actually, is exactly what you said, the access. Actually, maybe we should use the term white privilege. Oh, ah, oh, yeah. oh please. Oh, my. Oh, okay. I don't think Sorry. so. No, let's not okay. go there. Not on the Mormon okay. News Roundup. Nope. Okay, no. I will strike that. That I will strike <laughs> that from the record for sure. Now, there is a small issue with the name of the church here that I also notice here. I'm, I'm a nitpicker. What can I tell you? Yeah. He, uh, Donnie, uh, writes Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day oh. Saints. Do you see a problem with that there, uh, Rebecca? Yeah, he's got do you the see hyphen, that? right? Or he's got the capital. Right. What did he do wrong? Yeah, he's got that. Well, but I don't blame Donnie. Nobody can keep up, and I believe that is why, if you've been paying attention. The church is now going as the Church of Jesus Christ. Now, I was kind of first tipped off to that by my missionary who said when they would go to the door, they would say, we're from the Church of Jesus Christ. Then I started noticing that that was being used in, you know, on the church website, in the church newsroom, on the church's humanitarian site. They literally have a logo that says Church of Jesus Christ. So I feel they're going to start using that more and more. And it's just an attempt to appear more aligned with the Christian community. That Latter-day Saint stuff, 
the hyphen. I mean, do your viewers know why we can't have the hyphen? Because the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is another church, another right. branch of the restoration. And they've had it for hundreds of years, you know, 150 years. So, you know, it's very interesting because, of course, in the DNC, there's a lot of fuss made over the actual name of the church, hyphens, capitals, everything. And here, just unceremoniously, we're saying, yeah, we're just going to go by the Church of Jesus Christ. And, oh, I have to say this if we have time. The funniest part, I think, of the whole amended lawsuit is there's a little caveat where it says, um, we know that this is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We are not going to refer to it as that throughout the lawsuit because we do not want to overuse the name of Jesus Christ. We don't want to disrespect a deity. So we are going to be using the word Mormon throughout, which is an acceptable nickname. So I just, I thought that was hilarious. We're like, oh, no, no, we, we can't use we can't use that because we don't want to disrespect the Savior, which we've all heard. Don't use that name too often. Don't use it lightly. Don't use it in a lawsuit about sexual deviance. <laughs> well, I love all, that. Did you? What uh, did you think about that? Well, all I can say is if you use the term Mormon church, we know that's a major victory for Satan. But if you just mess yes. up the hyphen, that's just a minor victory for Satan. Satan still rejoices victory. when you mess up the hyphen. Um, it's just not a major victory for Satan. You know what yeah. I mean? I just had no idea God was so uptight about punctuation and capitalization <laughs> and full names. And it's so confusing. Well, as a librarian, I think you could greatly appreciate yeah. that. I thought that that would be, I, I thought that would be right up your alley. Maybe, but I also like to break the rules. So if I can ah. cut out that hyphen or just drop off Latter-day Saints, I will say as a kid, my parents were real sticklers for that. Like we couldn't say Mormon. We had to say the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I was so embarrassed. That Latter-day Saint part, even as a kid, I knew that was weird. I knew other people didn't say that. And I just prayed that nobody would ask me what church I belong to. But if they did, and in front of my parents, I had to say the whole dang thing. And it was so awkward. Yeah. I will give you one guess here on um, how much these uh, dinners cost per plate. I'm only going to give you one guess. Uh, well, I'm going to go with the number of the dinner that I was supposed to be able to attend at Book of Mormon Central that I had tickets for before the tickets were taken away from me by Book of Mormon Central. And that was a whopping $250 a plate. I could have uh, had that kind of dinner, but I'm not, I don't know, privileged. <laughs> you're you're not famous. You're not privileged. I'm not famous. No, no I'm a nobody. You're not famous enough. You're you're famous on the Mormon News Roundup. I can tell you that, which reminds me, what do you there have on what do you have on the Mormonish podcast? Yeah. You know, what do you have coming oh. up on the Mormonish podcast that we can expect to see here? Yeah, let me think. We recently did a really interesting episode that I alluded to about near-death experiences because I think, and it kind of got into the science of it because I think it's really important to understand that all these people that are having near-death experiences and then telling you that they can tell you to do something. Um you know, that that's not really how it is. So that's very interesting. We have a podcast coming out on Monday um, about spiritual grooming. We talk with a woman. It's an extremely powerful podcast about what does that even look like? You know, we've heard a lot about grooming. Um, this is a woman early in her marriage. Her husband started to groom her spiritually using the church. Um, it's almost you're going to have to listen to it to believe it. it. She is using an avatar. It's such a such an incredible experience that she tells, but it really shines a lot on, light on that because we've all asked ourselves, how did these women get groomed? How did this happen? This shows what it's all about. So um, what else is coming up? I think those are the two major things that we're, that we're talking about right now. So, and then if I can plug our good book club, the other thing that I'm involved in next Sunday, we're talking about, I even have a book here and immense world. So if you guys want to join our good book club ever, find us on Facebook and just pop in. We have a meeting every second Sunday of the month, really fun community. So it's awesome to read. It's good to watch your news, but it's also good to read a book every once in a while. <laughs> that sounds tremendous. And you can find new episodes of the Mormon News Roundup every Every Sunday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I want to give a shout out to Weird Alma on Bandcamp.com for this episode's music. And thanks so much, Rebecca, for ruminating with me on the great and spacious beehive. And remember, remember. No unhallowed hand can stop this podcast from progressing. So long. When it comes to nicknames of the church, such as LDS Church, the Mormon Church, to remove the Lord's name from the Lord's Church is a major victory for Satan. 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 